All right. So I'll start this presentation with a bit time traveling because about three centuries ago, Nicholas Andre, a scientist, planted the seeds of one of the most renowned figures in the history of scientific publication. This is the crooked tree. So it represents the prevention of an irreversible disability in a growing organism. So in his publication, so was referring to kids. And the message that this figure conveys was so strong that even three centuries later, this is still one of the official symbols of the orthopedics in medicine. So now let's move forward and take a look at a bit more recent figure. So here we go. This is a typical layout that you see in high impact factor journals. So every letter in the alphabet gets a panel and it's really too demanding on the working memory. I mean, through which dimensions I'm supposed to look at the needle in this haystack, I don't know. And no one needs 3D pie charts anyway. So it's visually really noisy. And do we really need to create our figures in this fashion? Probably not. So let's take a look at the tools that Andre had to create his impactful figure. He had to work under candlelight using quill pen on a parchment paper. There was not even carbon paper or light bulbs. Whereas these authors had headphones to get some inspiration from music, powerful computers, computational resource, instrumentations, and everything. So to answer that question, I'll take a look at what, what was missing from the both figures. So obviously, Andrew's figure was missing data. We may think that it made this job easier, but on the other hand, we may need to define what is easy on 18th century. When we look at the new figure, it is definitely missing a clear message that stands out. It was really too crowded. So how can we convey a clear message using data and still be elegant? I'll try to do my best to give you necessary tools to create bigger, better figures at the end of this presentation. So whenever we visualize data, we map values into aesthetics. And in the context of data visualization, aesthetics are the quantifiable features of a graphic. And in static figures, these are the aesthetics that we are going to use position, shape, size, color, line width, or line type. Some of them are compatible with both continuous and discrete data, such as position, but it's of course limited. We cannot go beyond three dimensions. Shape applies to only discrete data, but you shouldn't use many of them, otherwise it's gonna be visually really crowded again. We are familiar with colors. We can use categorical or continuous color bars to give our data another direction, but it's really important to fine tune these elements so that we can make our figures easy to inspect and also interpret them correctly. To step up our game, we can bring interactivity to the equation of this data visualization and they bind this data and aesthetics with widgets, which are just eventful user interface objects that we are already familiar from web or our applications. And these are usually toggles, sliders, check and radio buttons, text box, drop downs, or click event, even, events or even scrolling events. So at the end of my presentation, I'll take you uh, on a hands-on journey into interactive visualization, we'll depart from Plotly, visit Express and regular stations in the notebook land. Then we'll move on to Dash and develop iCandy dashboards in Jupyter Notebooks, which is a recent edition by Dash. And then we'll make a brief stop at the Vola land and listen to the song of City of Dashboards. And then finally, we are going to deploy our dashboards to production super easily. But before doing that, we really need to know our charts. So, so that we can create proper canvas for uh, visualization to the type of data. So we have different types like uncertainty. We may wanna visualize amounts, proportions, comparisons. So I'll start talking about amounts. So, you know, these are categorized numerical values and we can present them individually or in paired plots. But there is one super important context in here, even if you use bars or dots or whatever, you shouldn't use bar graphs to show continuous distribution because the same plots 
can uh, the same bar plots and the error margins may point out to the different types of distributions. You should definitely check this bar bar graphs tag on Twitter so that we know how to use bar graphs better. Or we may want to visualize distributions. The most common ones, common ones are histograms and the density plots. These are super intuitive, but they may require arbitrary parameter choices and they may be misleading. For example, exact visual appearance of your histograms depends on the bandwidth. So you need to try different bandwidths and uh, verify which histogram or density plot works for you the best. A bit more fair representation of the distributions are cumulative density and quantile quantile plots. These are both uh, ordered scatter plots, but not many people are quite uh, familiar to interpret these. But the quantile quantile plots can be useful, for example, check if your data is normally distributed or not. So these elements are becoming more and more famous. So these are really useful to visualize lots of different distributions, and especially if you'd like to highlight the shifts between different distributions, where it may, may be box plots, violin strip charts, or Sina plots. If uh, you need to take a look at the comparisons between a limited number of distributions, let's say three or four, you can use stacked histograms or overlapping densities, but if you have more, then they can get easily confusing. So at the end of the day, if you have lots of different distributions and you'd like to uh, inspect them visually all at the same time, you can definitely use ridgeline plots. These are really useful. Again, for, yeah. So, sorry to interrupt. Can we ask questions during yeah, your course. presentation? Yeah. yeah. So on the previous slide, I was wondering about. Could, could you explain about uh, the difference between strip charts and Sina plots? And also, I've, I've, I'm using swarm plots. That's how they call it in uh, Seaborn, I believe. And are swarm plots one of these two? And if not, what are they? Mm -hmm. So strip charts and Sina plots uh, have different inclusion for the uh, outliers and also they have a bit different jittering factor so that the spread of the data on the horizontal axis uh, can have a bit, you know, different uh, shape. So okay. Sina plots are like the violins without the uh, plot area is filled out, whereas strip charts are mo uh, most visualized like box plots. So it's just a bit little different design. And the second question was about uh, pandas, you said? Swarm plots in Seaborn. I think there must be Sina plots or strip charts. I don't know which one they are. I am not super familiar with yeah. that library, but I don't know. I, I just sure. don't have that yeah. picture. OK, thanks. So for proportion, we again have pie charts, bars, stack bars, and uh, all these elements. So if you have a few groups, let's say two or three, you can use group bars or stack bars. But whereas if you have multiple grouping conditions, then and still want to uh, describe proportions between of them, you may want to use mosaic plots and tree maps. If you have more than two grouping conditions, then you may want to use parallel sets. And the XY relationships, we are already familiar with scatter plots. For two variables, you can just use a simple scatter plot. But if you have three variables, let's say you can map one of those values as the size of these markers and create something more comprehensive. You may want to go ahead and add another layer on top of that with colors, but then it will be pr probably too demanding on the working memory. We can have paired scatter plots. So we can, this is, this is just a scatter plot, but it's, it's, uh, it has the identity line so that you can better tell the differences between a test retest measure, let's say for paired measurements that are really close to each other. And we can also use slo uh, slope graphs to compare uh, paired comparisons before and after a treatment, for example. If we have too many data points and then these are going to be overlap and it's probably not going to give us a good perception of the underlying distributions. And to better visualize them, we can use density contours, 2D beans, hexagonal beans. And if we have more than two quanti quantities, we can use correlograms. So these are like heat maps, but instead of squares, they have uh, circles changing in size and color depending on your 
variables. And if you have a monotonically increasing uh, horizontal axis, then you can use uh, connected scatter plots or you can fit a smooth line graph to the, all the data points that you have in your data to create a neat visualization. And if you have large data sets, you may need a smooth trend line. So as in this smooth line graph. As for uncertainty, um, we are all familiar with error bars. So there are different types of error bars that you can place on bars or you can use uh, multiple ranges for graded er error bars as you see in the, like for different confidence ranges. And you can give more detailed information about how ever ranges the span of the actual distribution with these confidence strips, eyes, half eyes, or quantile dot plot. And if you wanna add, the, add an uncertainty plot to your line graph, you can use bands. These are pretty similar to error bars, just a different types of visual representation. And probably our favorite ones are the tailored char charts. So uh, maybe a surface rendering for your brain data, or you, can, you may wanna use a connectogram, or you may even wanna create a GIF for the animated act activation maps. So up to this point, the serialmentor.com database, uh, it's the digital version of this book, helped me a lot. It's a really great resource. You can definitely find in depth uh, descriptions about everything that I was talking about. So if I left a few things unanswered, there are really good answers to that in this book. And now I'd like to talk a bit about reducibility and repeatability of data visualization because the descriptions change a bit when we compare to the reproducibility of an analysis versus when we are talking about the reproducibility of a data visualization. So we have three data visualization plans. In the basic one, there is no data. It's just figure available and nothing else. So it's a static figure living in a PDF and there is nothing much you can do about it. But you can create reproducible visualizations. And in this one, you have uh, plotting data available and you specify your transformations so that the original message is conveyed as is. But if the code is not available, people may have difficulties in repeating the exact same figure that you put in your publication. So which bring, bring us to the repeatable visualizations, the best uh, data plan. So in this case, your code available, your environment is available. If you have some random number generators to create your figure, you see that the uh, generator so that you control your randomization factor so that you can duplicate the original one. So this is what we'd like to achieve, to create repeatable figures that we can interact. So this is the puzzle of interactive data visualization. So you have widgets, you know your charts and you made your decisions about how to map your data values on the certain aesthetics. And then you write your code and you did your graphic design thinking. And the last thing that you need is a bit inspiration, which is super important. You wanna create eye candy visualizations that convey a clear message and you want them to be repeatable. So let's take a look at the, to the spectrum of data visualization. This is quite wider than we may imagine. So I will uh, give an example from the furthest end, which is an interactive experience. This is called data cocktail. They take, um, they, they have few keywords on Twitter, the hashtags, and they check the five latest messages. And depending on the frequency uh, of those tags, there is a robot with a shot glass moving through these different uh, containers and creating you a cocktail. And in the end, it gives you a report of the different proportions of all these tweets and you can actually drink these tweets. So this is one way to interact with your data. You can drink it as a cocktail, which is super fancy. Okay. 
But the, of course, this is the interactive experience. This is number five. Let's begin from number zero, which is static figures prepared in Excel. Probably none of us is doing it anymore. And the second step is the code-based static figures. You can use Pandas, Matplotlib, or Matlab, all those libraries, the, your favorite choice to create a static figure. Or you can use interactive figures using um, libraries like Plotly or Bokeh. And then the next step is interactive dashboards. If you know how to use these fancy graphic design tools, you can create data art and you can also create an interactive experience as we saw. So who are, uh, ah, and there is also some uh, transition steps. There is Vola, which is bit something between interactive figures and dashboards. And there are some really good interactive uh, visualizations prepared in JavaScript, which is D3GS. And uh, there are some good examples in distal.pop. And these are between, I think, dashboards and data art. But who is using static figures in Excel? Probably our parents to do their pension plans. Code-based static figures are commonly used by scientists to create visualizations, to put in papers, PDFs. Interactive figures and dashboards are cool by, uh, again used by scientists, but probably cooler ones who would like to create repeatable and interactive figures. Data art is created by artists for a living and interactive experience is created by Supreme Geeks for a living. So this is an interactive figure example. It's a, a scatter plot. It's a bubble plot with uh, every data point has a different size and color depending on their category. And you can use this slider to see how life expectancy changes with respect to the GDP. Uh, across these years. So it's just one panel, but lots of information captured in it. This is an example from our notebooks. This is an MRI signal. You change an acquisition parameter and see how that signal changes. So this is the MRI. Now, right now you're interacting with the MRI physics, and then you can also see the real world application of that same phenomena. And we acquired some different images and then created a map, we can inspect those map values one by one. So these are parametric maps. Or you can navigate across the slides of a 3D volume or even use surface rendering in 3D and see all the uh, structural connections. Dashboards are a bit more sophisticated than interactive, visuals, uh, interactive figures because now you can create callbacks between lots of different panels and add interactivities to that so that every panel is going to be updated based on certain events. So this is an example dashboard to zoom in your data. This is for uh, fMRI time. This, this, this shows you the fMRI time series and also the fitted model, voxel by voxel. Or you can use a dashboard to zoom out so this is a review article and it has its own dashboard for real-time fMRI methods. So you can browse existing papers, you can create visualizations with respect to the different processing parameters or even hardware parameters, or you can submit a new data set after you finish a study with real-time fMRI. And this is purely based on Plotly Dash. If you'd like to uh, take a look at more interactive visualization examples, you can go and visit these sources. There is Big Picture Group by Google Brain. There's Plotly Chart Studio, Visual Loop, and there is also Neurolibre, something we are working on to make it even better. So what about data art? This is from an EEG study. So Participants were listening to music and they were measuring different uh, types of activities, how focused they were or how uh, relaxed they were. And they plotted this time series into this nice graphic and they gave them to their participants at the end of their experiments. There's this interesting cool uh, tool called Morph. You can- okay, Can I ask a quick question on the last slide? Yeah basically creates random visualizations for any type of data set. 
there is another real-time personalized Aga? data visualization experience. Aga? Probably doesn't apply to our time, but let's watch this video a bit. This is also- uh, Aga, can you hear us? Can you hear the- Cleaver Franca combine technology and visualization to create a new sensory experience during a unique night out. Using data, technology, and smart fashion, the experience of clubbers was measured throughout the night. Entering the club, they got a custom-made bracelet with integrated sensors designed by fashion label Viborn. The bracelet tracked personal data from the audience like temperature, movement, and levels of excitement. Together with Centrum, Viscunda, and Informatica, Clever Franca developed an innovative platform that brought the generated data to life. An ambitious undertaking, massive amounts of sensory and location data had to be interpreted in real time and translated into compelling, intuitive graphics that were broadcast live during the event. The real-time visualizations showed the activity of the clubbers, their so-called sixth sense. The audience also received a unique personal souvenir. Claver Franco summarized each guest's unique information into a flight of the night recap made available as a gift in print as well as online. Yeah, so this is a really high-end uh, interactive experience that you probably can no longer experience, but you really don't need to go all these lengths to experience a data. So this is, this interactive visualization is created only by scrolling and it's showing the wealth of Jeff Bezos in scale. So it's, it's something, this is called one pixel weld. So you can keep scrolling till you get carpal tunnel syndrome, but it won't finish. So you get to understand how wealthy Jeff Bezos is just by scrolling. Or another more relevant visualization is searching COVID-19. This is by Google. They are visualizing search patterns uh, across the timeline from the beginning of the first coronavirus COVID-19 case to the date so you just scroll down and see what questions people were asking at some point many people asked for example how to use zoom so this is a really interesting interactive visualization experience you can definitely visit this data artists on behance it's really great source for inspiration and you can use these keywords to make a search on behance so now i'm going to talk a bit about how to create infographics there's okay. a great yeah. I, sorry to interrupt. I think someone had a question a few, a few slides back. Mm -hmm. um, um, it, it was me, but it's okay. I was just going to ask about what the EEG visualization thing. Um, we can go back to it at the end. Ah, okay, sure. I, I have links to all those visualizations, by the way. Cool, I'll, thanks. I'll, I'll share no, no, no. So Canva is my favorite tool for uh, graphic manipulation. It's a browser-based web application. And good thing is that if you have GitHub students package, you get Canva Pro for free for a year. I think you should definitely go out, go out and check it if you'd like to create some infographic or infographic video for your project. It's gonna be super useful. And infographics represent information with the help of charts, graphs, and pictures. And it's really super easy with Canva to prepare it. You go ahead and find a template, you add your visual, you, uh, visuals and then customize it. And boom, at the end of the day, you have a visually appealing infographic. So this is an example for Interstellar Timeline, History of Daft Punk or Coffee Harvest Calendar. These are all drawn from Canva. So these exist as templates. So you can just take them and uh, adapt them for your own purposes. To create video infographics, first you need to create still graphic assets. So we talked so, about so just to just to point to point out here, like this is this is the key part of, of this week's deliverable, right? This is what people should use to prepare their their infographics. These or if they like to prepare an uh, interactive figure or dashboard, uh, it's going to be after this presentation. It's it's perfect. About perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And transparency is important. And here it is even more important because you really want to have transparent background images to create a nice composition for your video. And to do that, you can use some resources like Canva, FreePick, uh, DrawKit, or some other resources that I'm going to show up. Then once you can download these, 
you may want to uh, change how they look, especially if they are SVG drawings, vector drawings. You may want to use Inkspace or GIMP for as free alternatives to Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. And then the next step is going to be animating these visual objects and adding them a voiceover. You need to have a story. And to do that, I always use PowerPoint because it's quite powerful. You can create nice animations and you can also export your video in the most common formats, such as MP4 or MOV. You can also modify these with open source software, uh, such as Shotcut or Blender, if you want to do something even fancier than a simple screen recording, or if you know how to use Adobe After Effects, or if you have iMovie, you can create even more fancy videos. Uh, I have an example video infographic. This is something I prepared for a competition a few years ago. So let's see how it goes a bit. In the next magnetic moment, I will explain you why MRI with numbers is different than the regular MRI and how our tool, QMR Lab, makes it easy to use. Every MRI image is a symphony. And just like a symphony, the image is composed of many parts. Each of those parts is a complex melody played by different instruments. Let's hear one of our favorites, the Brain Symphony. Symphonies are pleasant to listen to, but only a skilled conductor can tell when one of the instruments is out of tune. That is why it is important to break down the music into the individual instrument solos. Wouldn't it be easier for them to hear each instrument separately? And this is where MRI with numbers comes to our help. Think of a magic hat where you can put regular MRI images in, cast some magic spells, and produce a separate music sheet for each instrument. This is what MRI with numbers does. From these music sheets, we can create a solo for each instrument. Let's hear the symphony again, but this time each instrument will play one by one. Yeah, I, I think you got the point. This was intended for a really lay audience. You, you may need to dumb down this much, but I used be, uh, beautiful vector drawings from FreePick Canva and then wrote a little song on GarageBand and composed all of them to create a video to be understood by uh, 11, 12, 13 years old uh, audience. And this is a list of useful resources. So if you'd like to uh, check out some Infographics, Visual Loop is a great resource, or you can pick free visuals from uh, Ionicons, the Non Project, Free, free Pick, Undraw, I can say VecTZ, or all these tools. And then you can copy paste them in Canva easily and change them as you like. And if you have Adobe Creative Cloud, I think you already know how to manipulate all these fancy objects. So, yeah, this is the end of this presentation. If you have any questions, uh, I can answer them right now. Then now I'm going to move on uh, for the creating interactive figures and dashboards. Thank you very much, Agar. That was awesome. Any question? Um, sure. I mean, I guess I'll... Uh ask uh, my question from earlier. Um, Aga, thanks. That was a, a great presentation. I really liked uh, all the illustrations and I took several notes down of like links you mentioned that I'd never heard of before that seemed great. Um, so uh, when you mentioned the EEG um, art, it was right before I think you showed us like the rave. Um, they, uh, there are these nice series that showed essentially like the time series of their EEG single, but like in a circle. Um, I was wondering it, what color meant in those plots, if you knew, or if it was just added as like an artistic effect. Yeah, no, uh, I can try to share it again, or just a second. Let me go back to the slide and share my screen from that point. 
And just to confirm, someone just asked, and I already answered yes. The slides are going to be shared in the content panel of Slack. Correct? It's, it's already shared. So now, now I'm going to give you the link. So in this one, the focus, uh, how focused you are while you're listening to music represented by the, uh, can you see my screen, by the way? Yeah, we can. Yeah, this outer yellow lines. And the inner one is flow, how relaxed you are. And the ones on grayscale are alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and theta. Okay. In the next slide, I think there was a bunch of like red and stuff like that too. Are they just like a different color yeah. co uh, yeah. code of the same, fi same five or six variables or? Yeah, exactly. They just okay. use different random color maps for different participants, but the order of the mapping was always the same. Cool. So this this project is called Brain Dance. You can check it on Behance uh, for more detailed um, explanations about how they created it. Awesome, thank you. It's Behance.net. It's the GitHub of visual artists. Now I'm going to share my... Um... I had a quick question, I got about yes. uh, interactive figures in particular. So mm -hmm. how, how, how do they play with um, with regular publications, scientific publications. I mean, most of us will publish in journals where they expect PDFs and how do we reconcile that? I mean, right now the venue where you can submit an interactive figure as a part of your paper is quite limited, but uh, this is one of our projects, NeuroLibre is one of them, where you can uh, publish all these interactive figures alongside with your PDF. So there will be a companion uh, object that gives you all these opportunities. But if you check like distill.pub, they have that kind of publication uh, where they can, it's, it's all based around an interactive dashboard or interactive figure to get a better understanding of what they're showing. Okay, thanks. Now I will share the link to my GitHub repo that I prepared for interactive visualizations and dashboards. So you can see the link, Let me share my screen. There's a link to my presentation. It's uploaded to Zenodo. You can download it. The link is in the Zoom chat, by the way. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I set up a binder. You can, uh, if you'd like to repeat what I'm doing, you can click the binder link and follow me for step by step. Or you can use repo to Docker or create a new Conda environment for that. But I don't think that we have enough time to do all those things now. But I will serve <coughs> my notebook from my local. A second, here we are. So I'll start with Plotly Express. Well, it's super slow. Anyway. So this is a really um, high level wrapper for basic Plotly objects. And this came with the Plotly release 4.0. So they say that Plotly Express is Plotly to what Seaborn is to Matplotlib. And in a few lines, you can really create highly uh, sophisticated interactive figures. So I'll import this library and read the Iris dataset. And now I will create a scatter plot for this iris data set that has six columns and each of them having their own label. And uh, I will see the correlation between the sepal width and the sepal length variables. It's just two lines of code. You define what's going to be on your x axis and what's going to be on your y axis, and it will create you this nice interactive scatter plot. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, pandas data frame, that's a great asset to uh, make to use it with Plotly Express because it takes that kind of data as input. Yeah, what if I want to highlight different species with colors? 
uh, as a you know categorical uh, categorical selection object for my scatter plot, and then you define x, y, and then just say okay, now color them by species, and here we go. You have your labeled scatter plot again in just two lines of code, as long as your data is nicely uh, contained by a data frame. And yeah, if scatter plots are not enough, and if you want histograms, you can just pass a few more arguments, like marginal y, as this different types, and it will create you different uh, the stacked histogram distributions on one and then another type of representation on the vertical axis. And yeah, we can add box plots or violent plots to our histograms. And of course, trend lines. There's also a way to create a scatter plot matrix to show correlations between all these different uh, variables in, uh, included in the data frame. You just need to pass the name of the dimensions. In this case, it's sepal width length and all other variables that we have in this data set. And you can still categorize them with respect to species, which is really cool. And if you like to use proportions, I said during my presentation for more than two different grouping variables, you can use parallel sets. And for that, I'm going to import a different data set that has these total bill, tip sex, smoker, daytime, and size dimensions. And then you use px.parallel categories. You will pass your data. You, you're going to color them by size and you can put them on a continuous scale and it will take everything and create you this nice parallel set that you can interact with double click single out and see how they are proportionately changing with respect to each other. So you can uh, visit this reference documentation to see all available Plotly Express charts and all of them have different attributes that you can quickly change and give, you, give your uh, plots a different look. And if you want to include a slider to your data, it's also super easy with Plotly Express. You will, uh, in this data set, I'm using the GetMinder data set that's embedded in Plotly Express. And here I will say use GDP per capita for X and life expectancy for the vertical axis. And then you add an animation frame, which is year in this case. And you can also create different groups by country. And you can see how it changes over years just by clicking and two, three lines of code with Plot Express as long as your data set compile uh, is in as long as you can use your data set in that specific boilerplate uh, data format. And can I just tool. add one thing about uh, Plotly, uh, Agra? Yeah. Um, one thing that's, that I really like about Plotly is with these Plotly Express objects, it gets you really nice, um, like, you know, plots right away. Um, but as Aga said, you know, they're, if they fit the boilerplate, those, these will be perfect. Um, however, they give you like the, structure that defines how the graph will look so you can customize anything you want after that. Um, so I will often use like I'll find myself using a Plotly Express to give like the scaffolding of what I want for a figure and then mm -hmm. have a bunch of lines afterwards tweaking it like to make it super custom and work exactly for, for my data set. So it's it's a really great library for both like starting off well but then customizing after that. Yeah exactly. Thanks Greg. And yeah you can also easily give it a different theme but as Greg said, one way to uh, create a bit more custom uh, interactive visualizations to start with Plotly Express and do something else with it. But uh, if you'd like to do something a bit more fundamental, you may want to use Plotly's um, graphing library. And in that case, uh, you, you are going to interact with these objects at a bit lower level. And I'm going to give you a few examples. Sorry, my computer is really slow today. Okay, 
So this is the plotly.graph objects and you can import them in this fashion. That's the convention. And you can easily create a bar graphs by uh, creating first a figure object by go.figure and then you create a bar plot with data equals go.bar and you pass your data and you say that it's going to be in horizontal orientation. And then just you're going to get a bar graph super easily that is of course interactive. You can create heat maps. It is again another object called that heat map and there are lots of attributes of all these objects that you can change. You can add uh, some annotation text or we of course need labels on the horizontal and vertical axis for evening, afternoon, morning and the days and a color bar in this descriptions. Or you can visualize distributions using box plots and in this example there are six NBA players and each of them scored some point in 50 games in 2012. So we create our X data which is a list of players and equal 50, we created some random distributions here and created our colors for each of these players and then create our figure. And we add trace for each player to this figure and each of these traces are going to contain box. So in a figure, um, you can combine different types of traces. So I can combine a box plot with a scatter plot or whatever I like from that are available from the library. And at the end, I got this nicely uh, arranged and colored box plot distributions. So we can, of course, these are interactive, but I cannot change the dimensions that I'm looking at this data. To do that, I need to use widgets. And with Plotly, you can use Jupyter native widgets from the IPy widgets library, you can get interactive, which is which makes interaction super easy by using a decorator. And in this case, I created a sinusoidal wave and add, yeah, in three dimension. And I can change the frequency using this slider. to interact with the 3D plot. Or you can use Plotly figure widgets. So uh, figure widgets can also be combined with this Jupyter native uh, uh, interactive widgets, but you can also use something uh, that is embedded in Plotly graphs. But there is a difference. If you'd like to create Plotly styled interactive figures with sliders and everything uh, showing up in the Plotly's formatting, then you need to embed all the different data sets that are going to be created at the event of the scrolling. So then you can export them as standalone HTML objects, but they are a bit actually laggy. They are not super performant. But if you use figure widgets, you're going to interact with these objects much faster. You can change any attributes like the line color or background color to make them slate grade and everything. So in this case, it gets easily complicated to combine many different uh, plots in one place because um, Plotly library itself is not meant to be uh, a library for creating dashboards. To that, they created a, a better library, which is much more powerful in terms of callbacks and everything, which is Plotly Dash. But before showing that, I like to show you Vola. So you can create an interactive figure that pretty much looks like a dashboard with lots of widgets and everything, but you may want to use it outside of, of a Jupyter notebook. So what Vola does is that it captures this inline outputs of your interactive figures and renders them as like a standalone web page. So I installed Vola in my environment. There was a link or that button, I clicked it. And now my Jupyter notebook with interactive figures are going to look like a web application that has some dashboards in it.
Now it's going to execute all the lines, all the cells, and collect their outputs. Another cool thing uh, about this is that you can add a binder link. Um, oops, I cannot. Yes. It's still executing. Yeah, here it is. So this is the outputs of the notebook, but I don't have the Jupyter, I don't have the Jupyter notebook interface. So it looks like I have a standalone web application with all the uh, interactive functionality available to me. So this is the example using Plot Express, or I can use the one with the figure widget to have something like dash-like rendering and interact with them. Yeah, but is this really a dashboard? No, even if you can uh, access to these objects directly using this link, this is Walla dashboard, it directly, uh, it bypasses the Jupyter notebook interface and gives you uh, the same uh, Walla environment running in a Jupyter server. But in Walla land, the city of dashboards are actually just serving for us. So if I want to share this link at any time and expect someone else to interact with these objects, it's not possible because these environments are created on demand by Binder because Binder and Vola may look like a good couple to create you interactive dashboards. They are actually not that powerful. So what if we were able to wrap our dash application in an iframe and put it on our blog post. It would be rendered immediately and have all the functionality, almost like a JavaScript object, but it would be running some Python project in the background. So how can we achieve this? To do that, we need to deploy our dashboards as a web application. So in this case, what you see is an iframe of a dashboard that I created from the examples and it's just available right away. And how are we gonna do this? How can we deploy Dash to production? The good thing is we can do this in five easy steps by combining Dash, Dash Heroku and GitHub Actions. I also created a repo for that. I will share its link quickly with you. and share it on the Zoom as well. It's okay, I can share it on Zoom while you keep going yeah. if you want. It's always a hassle to find chat in the way I'm sharing my screen. Okay. So I created a template repository that you can change it the that you can just change this app.py and deploy your dashboard to web and you can do this in five easy steps so you start by forking this repo and then create a free heroku account which is a platform as a service cloud provider then once you create your account you are going to generate an api key on your account settings and then bring that api key and add it to your github repository with the name Heroku API. And then you do minor changes in the GitHub Actions configuration that is included in this repo. By default, I put uh, the trigger branch as none, but you will change it to master. You will give your application a name, which, you, which should be unique. And you're also going to set your email that you used for registering to Heroku. And that's all. Once you push a change to master, GitHub Actions will trigger a new workflow. It will use your API key to create a new Heroku application and deploy it as a web application. And then your app is just going to be available as your app name.herokuapp.com. And then you can iframe it in your blog posts or share your links to make it available to everyone with zero execution. So that's super cool. Um, 
I added some instructions about how to develop or debug your Dash application and some other details about uh, Heroku. This is free, but it, it gives you uh, about 550 hours per month. And your, if, if your application receives no web traffic in 30 minutes, it sleeps. And it's also good because sleeping hours are not uh, counted within this 550 hours. So it's pretty cool. And you can also create multi-page dash applications if a single page is not enough for you. And there's a really nice example I include in this repo as well, which is the one that I showed you for RTFMRI methods dash. It's rendered as a dash application. So it almost looks like a website. Yeah. So these are all nice and good. We can do nice things with uh, dashboards, but how are we going to develop dashboards? If I still have time, I will, what time is it? Yes, you still have 10 minutes, Sangha. 10 minutes, okay. There is also uh, one notebook that I created for using dashboards in Jupyter Notebooks. I will quickly go through all the steps and show you what is possible with Plotly Dash. So we will import our Dash libraries. And Dash, uh, normally it's rendered as a the, the, the Dash server has nothing to do with the Jupyter server, but this latest edition called Jupyter Dash helps you bind outputs from a Dash application inside your Jupyter book. So you need to import this Jupyter Dash and also pass this parameter to infer Jupyter proxy config. And then we will uh, create a super simple uh, Dash applications. We will first define our app and we can link external style sheets to change the look of our dashboard scan. And this is how we define it inside a Jupyter notebook. You use Jupyter dash, you can pass a name here, and then you link an external style sheet. Whereas in, in a non Jupyter notebook interface, you define your dash applications in this fashion, dash dot dash. We don't have to define a server in notebook because everything is taken care uh, by Jupyter Dash. The, the first important uh, component is the layout. We need to decide which widgets are we going to use and how are they going to be appearing on our web application. And to do that, we will use app.layout and use, we, we will use some HTML components and also some Dash core components. So these HTML components, if you're familiar with HTML a bit, it's like div, uh, IMG, and or, you know, all available uh, HTML tags are available. And you can also use DCC to in include some widgets. So in this case, this DCC.input is a text box, and it will also have an HTML div. So I created it and now I'm going to run my application server in external mode. So it's going to open a new tab for me. So it says that now it's running on your local host and when I visit it, Right now, I didn't add any callbacks to this. So it's just a sim simple text box. You can write something, but nothing's gonna happen. I want to show you this panel because there is a really useful tiny toolbox in here, which is callback graph and errors. So you can actually debug your Dash application inside a Jupyter notebook and see all the callback dependencies, which is super cool. Now the second important component of a Dash application is of course callback. Without callback, it's not obvious to the application how these different widgets are going to interact with each other. So I'm just going to write a simple callback and a callback function, which is just going to take the input from the text box component property value. It will take the value and it will just pass it to the div as type children. 
you need to execute these callback cells once in your Jupyter notebook. Just pay attention to that because if you run that cell multiple times, it's going to keep creating clones of that output and your app is going to crash, but you can make multiple calls to your app.run server. So now when I run this, again in a new tab, just to show you how, let me say, yeah. Now whatever I type here is just going to be available right away as an output. And I'm also going to be able to see the callback graph of this app. Yeah, here. It says that there is a text box. I take that value and there is a callback function represented by this green dot. And then whatever output is generated, I'm going to put it as a children to this div HTML component. There is dash core component, which is nice, but there is another third party library called dash bootstrap components. So it gives you uh, better looking uh, HTML objects and widgets that you can interact with. And now I will render its output inside the Jupyter notebook. After defining my callbacks. And now I say app.run server inline. When I say inline, the output is going to be available inside the Jupyter notebook. And here we go. We have a darkly bootstrap team uh, dashboard that has a cart progress bar, spinners. You can even define some model windows. So you can almost create a website inside your Jupyter notebook. And from this point on, I guess sky's the limit. You can create multiple page applications. You can include rain renderings in this. It's all up to your creativity. And we can finally create another example for inline. Yeah. This is a simple scatter plot with a slider object that updates this graph. Or you can update a plot with multiple uh, input widgets. So this is the application that I deployed as a Heroku app. We have two drop-down menus to select different access. And we can even change the scale of the plot to be linear or log. So there, is, uh, there are links in all the notebooks and readme files that I provided to access more examples. There is a nice brain viewer that you can just copy paste everything into your Dash application and change your data points to create a yeah, brain surface viewer. So yeah, this, this is all I wanted to show. I know it's a, maybe a bit too much, but I try my best to make everything as easy as possible uh, in the repositories. I think there is enough uh, explanation uh, to get you going with all these examples. And it, I think the coolest thing to do with these dashboards and everything is to deploy a Heroku dashboard and store it as a web application for free.